My name is Ajib Zaimah Lamsah, my three last digit student's number 034. My name is Amelia Herianto, with three last digit of name is 002. Hi, my name is Daniel, and the last three digits of my name is 151. My name is Jessica Diva Herianto, with the last three digits of student registration number is 159. Hello, my name is Madhya Fafel Budiunawan with the last three digits of name is 140. My name is Nikada Diarmayukti with three last digit number 053. My name is Rafa Alili Ucaksono and my last three digit of student registration number is 120. My name is Rivka Angrisathan with my three last digit name is 179. My name is Harry with three last digits of my name is 220. I'm Elsa Putinjani with my last three digits of name is 133. My name is M. Kelvi Rizaldi with three last digit 108. My name is Radhika Tojiwa and my last three digit name is 211. Okay, so we start now with the introduction of the disease. Uh, hypokalemic periodic paralysis is a genetic disorder that causes muscle weakness to manifest, thus the individual's inability to use them. So this disease is a genetic disorder and is accompanied by low potassium level in the body, thus the name hypokalemic. Uh, the main cause is the genetic disorder, not the low potassium. The symptoms begin to appear in early childhood or adolescence and affecting one in a hundred thousand people. So it is quite a rare disease and is affecting more men than women. And uh, some persistent muscle weakness may develop later in the individual's life. The problem identification goals of hypokalemic periodic paralysis is the what is the definition the epidemiology, etiology, pathophysiology, diagnostic method, differential diagnosis, management, prognosis, and complication. And the main goal is to, uh, so that the learners can understand uh, the, all the problems and thus uh, explain it back to other people to raise awareness. The general goals are so that the readers and learners of this, uh, listeners of this presentation can detect, uh, diagnose, and treat and manage hypokalemic periodic paralysis. So that's it for the introduction. We go straight into the contents. Hypokalemic periodic paralysis is composed by three terminological words hypokalemic that means a low level of blood potassium, periodic that the type of this condition, and paralysis that means some sort of muscle weakness. So hypokalemic periodic paralysis is a condition that associates with a low level of blood potassium and leads to some sort of muscle weakness. Hypokalemic periodic paralysis is a hereditary disease that is linked with mutation in the cerebral muscle potassium channel. Now I will explain about epidemiology for hypokalemic periodic paralysis. The first often happens on men between age 25 until 40. 65% uh, of them had flaccid quadriparesis. Uh, their blood potassium level between 2 until 3 milli equivalent per liter. Thank you. So I will explain about the etiology of hypokalemic periodic paralysis. So this is divided by two, uh, primary and secondary. So the primary type 1 hypokalemic periodic paralysis is caused by uh, mutation of the um, muscle calcium channel gain, CACNA1S. And the type 2 is associated with uh, mutation in the secretal muscle sodium channel gain. Uh, SCN4A. So this gene mutation is passed down by a uh, family, so this is the hereditary. But uh, secondary hypokalemic periodic paralysis is caused by another underlying disease like renal cause, renal tuberal acidosis, Gettleman syndrome, uh, Barter syndrome, primary hyperaldo 
sternism, and the gastrointestinal loss like diarrhea and endocrine cause. So the risk factor is if you have a family history with uh, hypokalemic periodic paralysis. And the trigger factor is uh, vigorous exercise, stress, and high carbohydrate meals. The pathophysiology of hypokalemic periodic paralysis is still not confirmed. However, some researchers suggest an notification between hypokalemic periodic paralysis with gene mutation in potassium, sodium, and calcium ion channel that triggers change in the flow of into and out of the cells. The, this flow of ion is a central part of how your muscle work in your body, and in periodic paralysis, the ion channel sometimes fails and the muscle cells don't work correctly. So here is how the diagnosis method of the hypokalemic periodic paralysis is. Firstly, we do the anamnesis based on the basic four in section 7. In hypokalemic periodic paralysis cases, patients will complain muscle weakness attack or paralysis itself. We need to know about the onset, locations, chronology, frequency, and else about the paralysis. And then we need to ask the patients about the past illness that might be the reasons of the paralysis, such as renal or adrenal or thyroid dysfunctions that we need to exclude. And then the most important one is family history of hypokalemic periodic paralysis or flaccid paralysis attack that is identical to the patient's attack. And then we need to know uh, about the drug using, like is there any drug like diuretic drugs or laxative abuse that might be induced these uh, conditions. After that, we need to do some physical examinations, some lab tests and the genetic test, which is the gold standard. Hypokalemic periodic paralysis is suspected if there is a sudden flaccid muscle weakness, but the deep tendon reflexes are normal or decreased. And getting more suspected if there is a similar muscle weakness attack on patients' previous history or family history. Further diagnosis investigations are no longer needed to confirm if there is a hypokalemic periodic paralysis in family history. Diagnosis is confirmed uh, by genetic testing, but if genetic mutations is hardly identified, a low serum potassium levels throughout the attacks may be established the diagnosis. So, for the patient's illness, we need to ask about the patients about the uh, by the sacral seven. So, where's the locations? The locations of the hypokalemic periodic paralysis usually uh, can be focal, but can be generalized too. So, it can involve one or more limbs associated to the hypokalemic uh, status and then the onset is usually on the first and the second decade of life but can still happen on the third decade and but usually the first attack usually happen at the age of 5 to 35 age of age and the quality is about the presence of the treatment paralysis and the permanent uh, myopathy in patients. And the quantity, did it happen once or more? So the attack occurred repeatedly uh, with intervals can be daily, uh, weekly or monthly. So it's two or more attacks. The chronology, attacks can occur, occur spontaneously but also can be triggered by other things like carbohydrate-rich meals, alcohol, and rest uh, after the strenuous uh, exercise. And then the modif modifying factors, likewise the chronology, diet, alcohol, and rest after the exercise can induce this situation. And then uh, associated symptoms, usually not present, but there is possibility that the muscle weakness can occur in muscle that help patients to breathe and swallow. Hello, my name is Madhya Pafen Ludinawan with the last three digits of name uh, 140. And I will uh, tell you uh, further about the diagnosis method of hypopp or hypokalemic periodic paralysis. And the first one that I will tell you is about the physical examination, which we can get a decreased muscle tone or flaccidity. The other thing is we can get lateral asymmetric ascending paralysis that is more proximal than in distals uh, with uh, sparring of cranial muscles. Uh, the third one is we can uh, get deep tendon reflexes that are normal or decrease and plantar reflexes that are normal. Downward movement of tooth. Uh, the other test we can use a lab test which we should get concomitant hypokalemia which is uh, usually pronounced uh, at 0 0.9 until 3.5 millimol per liter and other that we should get thyroid function test and ECG. And the other model uh, we can uh, use as a diagnostic, mo diagnostic model, we can use uh, three models that is shown in the presentation. The first model, uh, we can uh, diagnose uh, hypokalemia, periodic paralysis, uh, if, if we uh, 
if we get uh, two or more attacks of muscle weakness in the patient with documented serum potassium under 3.5 milli equivalent per liter. Other than that, in model 2, we can uh, get one attack of muscle weaknesses in the probandus uh, and one attack of weakness in one relative with documented uh, serum potassium, uh, the same as the first model. And the third model is we can get three or more of the following six uh, clinical symptoms or features uh, which is shown in the presentation. And if we uh, can get uh, suggestive findings that it is uh, hippo PP in the patient uh, after the anamnesis and physical examination, uh, we can recommend a multigen uh, panel to search for uh, uh, for genetics uh, abnormality in the patient that is related to the hippo PP, which is uh, a CAC and A1S, SCN4A, and other genes of interest. So for the differential diagnosis of the periodic paralysis, the first one is the normokalemic periodic paralysis, and then hypokalemic periodic paralysis, the most common cause, and then the hyperkalemic periodic paralysis, and then the anderson tabel syndrome, and then the tyrosotoxicosis periodic paralysis. The hypokalemic periodic paralysis here can be contributed into two parts. The first one is the primary HPP, with then uh, hereditary etiology, and then the second one is the secondary HPP. Uh, there are several etiology here can be contributed into the first part is the tyrotoxicosis and then the renal tubular acidosis and then the primary hyperaldosteronism and then the barter syndrome, Gittleman syndrome, uh, gastrointestinal wasting, barium ingestion and then the lycoris ingestion. And then the differential diagnosis here, uh, what, what's different from it? Uh, so from the first one is the hypokalemic periodic paralysis based on the onset itself is uh, at the end of the first and then the second decade and then the resolution itself is usually hourly until daily and then the triggering events here is usually because of fever and then stress and then uh, eat lots of carb carbohydrate diet and then there's a lot of immobility that can trigger the hypokalemic periodic paralysis and then the second one is the normokalemic periodic paralysis uh, usually happen at the first until the second decade uh, the resolution itself is usually hourly until daily and then the triggering event is itself is usually the same as hypokalemic periodic paralysis and then the hypo hyperkalemic periodic paralysis here from the onset itself is usually early life and then the resolution is usually minutely until hourly and then the triggering events here mainly because of uh, consuming high uh, calcium or potassium ion uh, usually uh, after eating lots of uh, food or drink, drinking uh, like the sports drink that uh, usually contains a lot of uh, potassium ion and then uh, there's sudden altered activity and then uh, there's many other things and then the teratoxicosis periodic paralysis here from the onset itself is usually since the hyperthyroidism onset usually the teratoxicosis onset and then the triggering events itself is usually similar to hypopp or hypokalemic periodic paralysis and then the last one is the anderson tabel syndrome uh, usually the onset itself is based on the post-cardiac manifestation and then the triggering events itself is usually the long immobility of the patients. Thank you. The management of hypokalemic periodic paralysis has the main goal of both stabilizing potassium levels as well as maintaining potassium levels of the patient. In treating the acute symptoms, the treatment of choice is potassium supplements in which the oral supplement is preferred over the intravenous. This is because the oral supplement is easily absorbed already and has a lower risk of overdose. The usual potassium salt used is potassium chloride, although studies suggest that the type of potassium salt that is being used does not matter too much. It is also generally better to take potassium supplement with water. Other preparations such as energy drinks are less preferable due to the high likelihood of energy drinks containing high levels of sugar and sodium concentration, both of which could induce an acute attack. To prevent further symptoms, non-pharmacological interventions such as low sodium and low carbohydrate diet, potassium supplementation, and avoiding hyperosmolar state like dehydration and hyperglycemia are the first that should come to mind. Furthermore, the use of drug groups such as carbonic anhydrase inhibitors and K plus pairing di diuretics are usually used. However, in some studies, uh, it is found that the use of carbohydrate anhydrase inhibitors doesn't work for everyone, only 
for or a percentage of the study group. Okay, now I will explain about the prognosis. Basically, the prognosis of patients with younger age are much more better than the old patients. Generally, with appropriate treatment and management of hypokalemic periodic paralysis, the patient will have his or her muscle strength restored to its normal state. But for patients with hereditary hypokalemic periodic paralysis, this condition cannot be cured. So, the patient must consume medication for life and also maintaining his or her diet and lifestyle to have a good result. There should be no problem as long as they take their prescription regularly. But again, the prognosis depends on the severity experienced by each patient. Patients with mild hypokalemic periodic paralysis tend to be more active with their daily life activities than those with the more severe conditions. Next, like what I've already said before, that the prognosis in younger age is better than the old age, that's because with age, the prognosis gets worse. Based on the study, majority in elderly patients with hypokalemic period paralysis will develop permanent muscle weakness. This makes activity like walking or climbing could be so tiring or hard for them. And they will end in needing a wheelchair. And for the mortality rate of hypokalemic period paralysis due to muscle attack itself are very rare. Mostly, the patient death is caused by a complication of the disease such as aspiration pneumonia, or it also can be caused by a lack of medical management. Now, I will explain about the complication of hypokalemic periodic paralysis. Uh, there are two complications that can be life threatening, such as uh, cardiac arrhythmia because of hypokalemic, and also acute respiratory difficulties because of uh, respiratory muscle weakness. These events are rare, although there are serious problems. There are also some common complications that can be happen in patients with hypokalemic periodic paralysis. There are long-lasting muscle weakness, myopathy, and complications related to therapy. The first one is long-lasting uh, muscle weakness. The frequency and the risk of this complication is still unknown. Normally, patients with hypokalemic periodic paralysis have normal strength during the interictal period, which is period uh, between uh, paralysis attack. Uh, but in some cases, patients will feel long-lasting muscle weakness. My, uh, the second one is myopathy. Uh, the myopathy is usually happen in the pelvic girdle and also proximal upper and lower limb. The third one is complication related to therapy. Uh, the most frequent complication is nephrolithiasis. Nephrolithiasis is happen as a side effect of uh, acetazolamide therapy. Well, the hypokalemic periodic paralysis or hypopp is a condition that associates with a low level blood uh, potassium and lead to some sort of muscle weakness. Well, the frequencies of the incident is more, more prevalent in men in between 25 and 40 years old. Well, the hypopp is divided by two types. The first type is a primary hypopp that caused by the mutation of two genes. The second one is a secondary hypopp that caused by the renal cause, uh, gastrointestinal loss, and endocrine causes. Well, uh, there are three types. Uh, three ways to diagnose uh, hypopp the first one is with anamnesis with uh, secret 7 and basic 4 the second one is with a physical examination laboratory examination and the third one is with kinetic test well uh, there are some triggers uh, for this hypopp the first one is doing a heavy exercise period the second one is consume the rich carbohydrate meal cold, stress, assault intake, and prolonged immobilization. How to prevent the hypopp? Of course, the first one is avoid the triggers. The second one is take uh, appropriate prophylaxis. Well, the prognosis uh, of hypopp is depend on the management and handling. If the management is good, it will give a good prognosis. But if the management is bad, it will give some complication, and they are the first one is cardiac arrhythmias, and the last one is acute respiratory difficulty. Okay, that's all about uh, our presentation today. Thank you.